acting? What made you choose that course? Um, I was inspired by a film called The Prince and the Pauper, which is a Walt Disney mm. production made in 1962, I think. Uh, I was at that point at school undecided what I wanted to do. And in the school holidays, I went to go and see the film Prince and the Pauper at Studio One, which is a cinema at Oxford Circus in London. Mm. Um, fell in love with the film straight away. Uh, it was only on for another two days, so I went and saw it another four times. <laughs> by the time I'd finished, uh, by the time I'd finished, the entire script was in my head, and I thought, "This is what I want to do." Uh, I don't know whether you're familiar with the story at all. Oh um, yes, yeah, but I so. you, you are. Yeah, that particular version starred Sean Scully, so I suppose you could say he was my inspiration. He's right. an Australian actor who I believe is still in one of those Australian soaps to this day. Right. And how did you go about getting into acting? What was the first steps? Um, well, having decided that's what I wanted to do, the next job was to persuade my parents, who uh, were not keen on the idea. Um, but they were at a slight disadvantage because my grandfather on my father's side had been an actor. So it was rather a difficult argument to, to put up, <laughs> saying, don't go, don't go on the stage. Um, but I then studied... Uh, I mean, I was 13 at the time, I suppose, something like 12, whatever I was. Um, I looked in a publication called Spotlight, which uh, contained all the actors and actresses of the day, including child actors. And um, I, they had an, a huge collection at the Westminster Reference Library. So I used to go there every day and make notes of who was with whom. And decide that I decided that the best school to go to was the Corona Stage School, which you may or may not have heard of. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, but it had a lot of the stars of the day uh, and people who became stars afterwards, Judy Geeson, Susan George, uh, Richard O'Sullivan, Dennis Waterman mm -hmm. and those sort of people. Um, my father knew a, a female director. and I think she was probably the only female director in television at the time called Joan Kemp Welch. Uh, and she endorsed the school, as did um, a, a friend, an army friend of his, who uh, whose two daughters went there. So, uh, having satisfied himself that it was a, a reputable setup, um, I, all I had to do then was to fail my common entrance exam for public school twice, <laughs> um, and then leave them with no choice. <laughs> so, what was your first acting uh, role then? Would you say? I don't know whether you called it a role or not. I don't know if you remember Cracker Jack, which the BBC oh, yeah, used to do. Yeah. Um, and and its host at that time was Eamon Andrews. Yeah. And I think they recorded it at Shepherd's Bush uh, Theatre, which belonged to the BBC in those days. And they needed stand-ins to uh, for the cameraman to work out their shots. So mm -hmm. that was the very first job, if you like, I did. Um, they paid two shillings, which is the equivalent of 10 pence. And uh, my agent took 25% of that. So I was left with one shilling and sixpence. <laughs> so how did you get the role in uh, the Tomorrow People? Sorry, say that again? Sorry, how did you get the role in Tomorrow People? How did you get the role in the Tomorrow People? Right. Um, when I wasn't acting, I used to, sorry, the term is resting, you may have heard that <laughs> phrase. Um, and there was a woman around unemployed. Um, I used to help my agent out, I used to go and work in her office. And I was sitting in the office one day and the call came through for this new television series that Thames was making. Um, and did we have any suggestions? So I was left with the task of um, suggesting people who might be suitable. And obviously, in my view, the most suitable person was my good self. So I made sure that my photograph, my photograph and CV was on the top and probably in the middle as well. Uh, uh, <laughs> so you might argue I used some undue inf influence, but I, I didn't go as far as to leave everybody else out by mistake. <laughs> and uh, when did they call you in? Did you actually do a, a screen test or anything like that? I I went in, I think I first met them at Euston, which uh, Thames Television had a presence in the Euston Road, and that's why their film side was called Euston Films. Um, and I met the director, the first one of whom um, was Paul Bernard, who had previously worked on Doctor Who. And I met Roger Price, who uh, created the series, and I think probably Ruth Boswell, the producer. Mm -hmm. And I don't think I was what Roger had in mind. If you read his original notes on the character of John as he saw it, um, that really wasn't me. Yeah. Um, so I don't know why they decided to choose me. Perhaps having met everybody else, they perhaps thought a sort of paternal character, who was half adult, half child, um, was it was a good uh, sort of point to, to make. And uh, 
he also wanted to have everybody from all sorts of different ethnic backgrounds and class backgrounds, which seems a little funny nowadays, but it was still alive and kicking in those days. Um, so to appeal to the widest possible audience, I think mm. that's probably why they thought I was quite a good idea, even though it certainly wasn't what he had in mind. Hmm. How did the first day of filming go? Um, well, we all met up actually to do a photo session for mm. the book there were four accompanying i think for at that point there's probably only one accompanying paperback books and i have a feeling we filmed it on wimbledon common or somewhere like that and that was the first time we all met together mm. uh to have some photographs taken for the front cover um and and those pictures were indeed used on the front cover um then I met Peter Vaughan Clark uh, for our first day of actual rehearsing at in the canteen of Thames Television in um, Broome Road. Of course, that studio no longer exists. It's a block of flats now. Right. Um, that's where I met. Um, but we actually did some pre-filming. That was the way things were done in those days. Anything that needed to be outdoors was usually filmed on 16 millimeter film and then dropped into the into the videotape section of the program. So I, I believe our first actual filming was uh, the, on the Thames where a, a boat was supposed to blow up in the very first episode. It all went horribly wrong because um, we filmed it and uh, t in order to health and safety such as it was in those days required the fire brigade and the police to be present while we blew this thing up. The explosion was pretty pathetic. Um, <laughs> so after the police and fire brigade left, we decided to do one two or three times more powerful uh, because it blew <laughs> the thing to smithereens. And uh, it caused a major panic throughout Surrey. I think it was about four or five fire engines turned up and loads of police because they thought it had all gone horribly wrong and the castle was dead before we even began, you know. <laughs> so that, that was our first filming day. How did it generally go? Did you um, sit down and go through the script together before you started to film the actual episodes? Uh, the way it was done in those days, uh, you'd have what's called a read through. Everybody sat round, what mm. the Americans call a table read. You sit round and literally read the script in front of you, and everybody reads their individual parts. Um, and then the director would start to do what was known as blocking, in other words, work out what moves that we were all going to do. Uh, and then you did it in a dreary rehearsal room where there was absolutely nothing other than tape lines on the floor, which was supposed to be the edge of the set. Um, and then you'd work, I say, you'd work out where you had to stand and where you had to move to and all that sort of thing. Um, I, I must say, and I don't mean this in any way nastily, but uh, it was quite apparent that at least a couple of members of the cast were <laughs> mm. a little bit below par. So it was a bit of a struggle uh, to start with. But uh, once we all got into it and we knew what our characters were supposed to be, um, we all worked, in my view anyway, we all worked together very well and we, we had great mm. fun. Did you get any direction about fun, fun. Um, the, the way that Sir John was supposed to be played? Not really, no. Mm. Um, in fact, I, I, I don't know whether you've got um, Andy Davidson's extra, uh, exceptionally good book called George. I'm not trying to give him a plug for any particular reason. <laughs> um, but in there, it does discuss, um, I should have marked this actually, it does discuss um, Roger Price's original um, ideas for the cast. Um, and as I say, they just, they, they don't bear any relation. I mean, he originally wanted to have twins in uh, one of the characters. Hmm. Um, let me just see storylines, casting of the Tomorrow People, page four. Are you okay for me to do this? Is this yeah, all right? Yeah, of course, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, let's just have a quick look at that casting. Right, here we go. John, the oldest of the six Tomorrow People in the series, about 16. Well, clearly, I couldn't get away with that even then. <laughs> um, he's the nearest thing they have to a leader and has a noticeable Cockney accent. That's a notable yeah. Cockney accent. Yeah. And he certainly didn't, didn't allow me to do that. So that shows you how way off the, my, my interpretation <laughs> of the character of John was. Right. And how did it work behind the scenes? So obviously you were a little bit older than the other cast members. Um, yeah. You know, did you get on well behind the scenes as well? Yeah, very well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I, I, closest probably to Peter Warren Clark, who sadly, as you may know, has just died. Are you aware yeah. of that? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. and that's absolute tragedy. Um, but yeah, he he and I always got on well. We always had a laugh. He he was um, anarchic and a uh, complete rule breaker and uh, a law unto himself. And I'm the complete opposite, of course. So that's probably why it worked so well. Mm. Um, and then uh, Carol was always a, a, a Sandy Windmill who played Carol was always a charming and lovely woman. Um, 
and uh, Kenny, who, you know, sadly, because his acting wasn't up to much, I think he'd be the first to admit he wasn't a professional actor. Um, you know, they gave him less and less to do, which is a bit sad. Um, yeah. So so that didn't really go anywhere. And of course, after the first series, he left. And so did Carol. So did Sammy Windmill. Um, so th- from a continuity point of view, it was just uh, Peter and me. Um, if, well, then they brought in, obviously, Elizabeth the Diary. But from the original series, it was just the two of us so that's probably yeah. another reason why we got on so well uh-huh. where about did philip sit when you were filming as a voice of tim um he was a very avuncular character um both in the series and in reality to all of us he was much older obviously a charming man lovely man um and supported us in everything we did and was mm. uh, good at giving us advice and happy to go over scripts and rehearse uh, you know on the quiet mm. when we weren't actually doing it officially um you know, some good ideas uh my only regret about his performance is that they didn't bother to work out how how his voice was going to sound until virtually we were in the studio and it was all done in a t- terrible rush and I think his voice could probably have been warmer than it turned out to be. It was a bit mechanical and a bit squeaky. Mm. Not squeaky is the wrong word, but raspy, I suppose, is a better word. Um, but he made it his own by giving his own interpretation to it. And, and it, it, I think he comes across very well as a warm character who was deeply fond of all the Tomorrow people. And that was reflected in, in reality. Yeah. Well, where was he positioned in the studio when it was filmed? <laughs> Nowhere very glamorous, I'm afraid. It was kind of <laughs> a little st- little stool behind one of the walls of the lab, um, <laughs> and, and with a pair of earphones on, which were huge in those days, and holding one of those big microphones. You know, um, it, it wasn't very glamorous, I have to say. I, I think I believe. I mean, this is the rumor. I don't know whether there's any truth in it. Never told me this, but I believe in the end he got a bit fed up with it and got his agent to insist that he was allowed to appear, which in later series, of course, he did mm. as the manifestation or personification of the character of Tim. And he appeared as, don't quote me because I think I'm going to get this wrong, um, Timus, I think, was one of the characters he appeared in. Was it Tipno the other? I can't remember. Yeah. Some some experts kind of scream at me, but I believe those were two roles he played. So he was able to physically appear in the programme. And Because, you know, he was a big rank star in the 1950s, and mm, you're aware yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and even if you watch Talking Pictures TV, and if you don't, you should, um, he appears on that from time to time. He's uh-huh. a very good episode of The Human Jungle starring Herbert Lom. He he has the, the guest lead in that. He was a good actor and a very good looking man, of course, which is mm. exactly what Rank wanted good looking men and beautiful women. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, the special effects, I mean, uh, I think this. The, the, they were of their time, obviously. I mean, there was nothing on TV that had really good special effects. But um, mm. what was it like wearing the spacesuits, particularly? Because that looked really uncomfortable. Um, well, they redesigned them later on in the series. I don't think they were uncomfortable. They were just unrealistic because there was clearly no glass in the helmet. So it was not going to keep yeah. any atmosphere in or any, at- any atmosphere out. So I was rather unhappy with the special effects simply because people say oh it was 1970s that's what it was like in those days that's not true mm. um if they'd spend a bit more time and effort on it um but again it was all last minute stuff one or two things were very good it, some spacecraft which were literally made out of uh canteen plastic cups those corrugated plastic cups mm. but painted with silver spray and so well they, they look quite good um but some of the other special effects could have been a lot better if it had a bit more time and a bit more thought had been put into it. I mean, just yeah. as a, a simple example was uh, when we were floating in hyperspace, um, in a lot of it, we're just standing on the floor and they've mixed the shot of me and Peter standing on the floor and then mixing it with a picture of the sky at night. And and all we had to do was a sl- <laughs> slow motion rubbish. Pointless, you're both searching the same sector. Yeah, well, that's true. Okay, Tim. Let's go. Check. 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 Any luck in your sector, John? No, nothing so far, Stephen. Me neither. Hey, just a minute. I'm getting a positive reaction from the life force detector. Perhaps it's her. Well, hang on a second. I'll join into your sector. Okay, Tim? Okay, John. It looks like Stephen might have found her. direction. Hang on a minute, Stephen. Let's take our helmets off. We can survive in hyperspace a few minutes without them. We don't want to frighten Elizabeth when she sees us. 
Um, but eventually we got a bit more adventurous and they stuck us on what's called curvy wires. Mm. Um, but you can see the wires. It might have been as well been an episode of Thunderbirds. You know, it's just ridiculous. Um, mm -hmm. And the colour we used in those days, it's called blue screen now, but in those days it was chroma key was very bright yellow. Uh, and essentially, if I understand it correctly, the camera simply electronically turns off the colour yellow and so you can't see anything that's yellow. Uh, so the background is yellow, you stick us on top of it, and you can't see the background. That's how it, how it works. And then you can mix mm -hmm. in whatever background you like. Um, but I, And I said, well, why don't you paint the wires yellow? Then they won't, won't be seen. Yeah. And somebody said, oh, that's a good idea. We haven't really got time. And I'm glad to say that one of the uh, technicians, or in fact, one of the gaffers, I believe, um, on the floor said, well, I've got plenty of yellow tape. Why don't we just wrap that around the wire? So it was literally that crude. You know? yeah. Wrap yellow, wire, <laughs> yellow tape around the wire. And of course, it did the trick. You couldn't see the wires. And, mm. and so that's what I mean when I say a bit more thought uh, before we'd started. And I think we could have had better special effects. Maybe better actors, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> when do you think Peter was eventually uh, replaced, effectively? He grew up. That's the sad yeah. truth. I mean, I was already there. He started off, I can't remember how old he was, uh, possibly 12 or something when we started. Um, and the whole what you see the whole concept of the tomorrow people is uh that this is the generation of people who were then in their early teens would all develop these special powers and the whole race eventually would be a whole human race would be homo superior as opposed to homo sapiens mm. um and and when roger sat down to write it he probably thought 13 episodes we can cover that story from start to finish and then we're done mm. nobody expecting it to go on for another 60 <laughs> odd episodes um and of course you've created a problem for yourself because as soon as the, the child gets becomes an, a young adult um mm. It's, it doesn't work anymore. You've got to bring in new people, which, of course, Roger did regularly thereafter. Um, and I think we hung on to Peter for about as long as we could. Yeah. Um, and it just began to look too old and they needed to introduce some fresh blood. Yeah. It changed your life quite a bit, didn't it? Because you were quite a, a, a pin-up during the day, weren't you? Sorry, say that again? Sorry, you were quite a pin-up. <laughs> When the oh, Pino. Yeah. yeah, well, Peter certainly was. Yeah, um, I always make the point. He was uh, he was certainly more, dare I say, better looking. I don't know. I, <laughs> maybe you might argue with that. I don't know. Um, but anyway, yes, no, certainly had a bigger fan base than I did. But then I, I, I like to think that I he appealed to quantity and I appealed to quality. That's how I <laughs> Well, you went your own fan club and everything, didn't you? Oh, yes. Yes. Sir. Well, there's the Tomorrow People fan club. Yeah. Um, and uh, I had an, an individual fan club and I think Peter did as well. Um, and yeah, I mean, it was hugely popular and, and sold to 55 territories around the world. It was Thames mm. Television's best best overseas sale, uh, apart from Edward and Mrs. Simpson, which was a hugely successful oh, series okay. about the abdication crisis. Um, and uh, the reason for that was... Um, Roger's forward thinking in making the cast international and therefore it appealed to people around the world. Yeah. And that wasn't, I don't, I don't know that it had ever been done, but certainly it wasn't very common in the early 1970s. Um, and and in, I, when I say all, you know, I talked earlier on about classes, um, to, to introduce the idea of, of uh, what we now must call Romany, uh, but gypsies in those days, that was an unthink unthinkable idea. Um, and obviously, Elizabeth Adari was African. She came from Sierra Leone, I believe. Or, yeah, I think that's right. Um, and uh, and Sutai, who was Japanese. Uh, it was a brilliant idea. Um, mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons for its secrets of the success abroad, I'm sure. Do you have any favourite episodes at all? Yeah, I think um, Blue and the Green was the best because mm. it was believable. You don't jaunt in and out of school like that. They'll catch you at it one day. Oh, don't worry. No one will notice. Well, not since you found out a way we can jaunt without using all those funny lights. Yeah, the hyperspatial zonal shift breakthrough, you mean? Yes, well, whatever it was called. Have a good day at school. No, thanks. Oh, I wish you didn't have to go. It's a complete waste of time. You have to go to school, Stephen, or you have the authorities after you. And we can't have you drawing attention to yourself. Yes, I know, I know. It's all right for some, though, isn't it? What have you been doing today? Been for a swim and a sunbathe in the Caribbean. Galleon Island. Yeah, some people do have jam on it. Well, you can still go. One of the advantages of jaunting. Distance, no object. 
You sound like a travel brochure. <laughs> hey, listen, there was a funny thing today. Well, there's a kid in my class called Robert. Oh, yeah? Well, he did a painting. He called it Change of Weather on Rexall 4. So? So that's just what it was. I've been to that planet, and he'd drawn it exactly as it is. Exactly. Hmm, interesting. Did you talk to him about it? Oh, sure. He said he made it up. You sure it wasn't just a coincidence? Not a chance. There was too much detail, and all correct. Whether he made it up, or whether it's been there, he drew Rexall 4 exactly as it is. Exactly as it looks when the weather is changing. Well, we're always on the lookout for new tomorrow people. Keep your eye on this Robert character, will you? Yeah, sure I will. But it'd have to be pretty well developed as a TP to jaunt as far as Rexall. Well, it's a good 30 light years. Besides, I've been bound to pick him up as soon as he started to break out. Well, seeing we're in the same school. Quite right. Well, what is he if he isn't one of us? I don't know. But I'm going to find out. There's something else been bothering me too. We've got this new teacher, well, a student really, on teaching practice. I think that once or twice I may have picked up some of her unspoken thoughts. Now that is interesting. Yes. And you like her too, John. She's a smasher. Just about your age. Yeah. Um, and I think that's most people's favourite, funnily enough. Um, I don't think I like living skins, although the special effects were a bit naff um, <laughs> in places. <laughs> um, but that that was a good one too. Um, anything that, that at Hearts of Sobbeth I liked, which I think was the first one that um, Mike Holloway did. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was another believable story. Yeah. And therefore much, much better, I think. Um, you know, the, the later ones where we've got um, aliens that, Look like uh, demented Daleks on Viagra. Um, <laughs> not so good. <laughs> yes, have you got any ones that uh, you think just really didn't work at all, like so wise? Yeah, that one. I just that told one. you that. <laughs> 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 yeah, I mean, when, when a, a monster becomes laughable, it's it doesn't work. It, it yeah. that applies to horror movies or any other damn thing. As uh -huh. soon as your audience starts la laughing at the special effects, you've lost them. <laughs> well, better not better not to have the special effects and just let people imagine it you know exactly it's always the thing off the camera that's uh, the scary thing isn't it yeah yeah well i mean that's the essence if you look at it's interesting again talking about talking pictures tv you watch all those british movies of the uh, 50s and 60s you never saw anybody getting knifed you just cut to a shadow on the wall of, yeah. of, of the knife doing that uh, but you never saw it yeah um and in many respects much more effective I, mm. as uh I mean, Hitch Hitchcock understood that, I think. Yeah, for definite. Mm. So eventually, obviously, it, it ended eventually. Um, why did you think that was? Do you think there was more life in it? There was more life in it, and it, it would have gone on. I think uh, Roger ran out of ideas for stories. Um, he actually employed somebody to write one story, which that that was the most tedious we've ever done. Um set in space I, I i can't even remember what the story was now jeffrey bailden starred in it he's a very good actor stephen garlic um but it didn't it, i think it went to four episodes and we, we all lost the will to live by the time it had finished it was just awful <laughs> and i'm glad to say that then roger came back and and you know contributed some more um there were budgetary problems there were strikes at thames television were relentless um there was a, a also a fire which you managed to get over. I, I think the series was going to be killed off at the end of almost every series, but somehow it managed to hang on. Yeah. Um, so I think there was more mileage in it, provided we could get some more decent stories. And I think that was the real problem, finding, yeah. finding more decent stories. It was certainly popular right up to the day, the last day it was shown. Yeah. I know you said before that uh, you had some ideas of your own for episodes. Did they ever get looked at at all? And what were they? <laughs> uh, I don't um, no, I, I I seem to remember I did write one script and I think it was a, a time travel one um, which of course we'd already done in one story we went back to Roman times, I can't remember what that was called now um, I think Roger felt uh, that he'd let somebody else write it and that was a terrible mistake mm. and he was right <laughs> <laughs> so um, the future, I don't think he was going to trust anybody else and I don't blame him for taking that view at all Hmm. So the American series, um, I mean, that was really good, I thought. Um, how did you get involved with the American version of it? Um, I heard that Greg Belanti, the producer, was making it. Um, it turned out he was a fan of the Tomorrow People, and which oh. I thought was quite extraordinary because he's not that old. Um, 
And I thought, well, I'll just drop him a line apropos Alfred Hitchcock we were just talking about. Um, and I just suggested him that he just had me a little cameo role like Hitchcock himself used to do in his movies. So mm. that, I don't know, people were in a cafe chatting and then just past the window, somebody walks past and he said, hang on a sec, was that, was that who I thought it was? <laughs> so it's one of those. Yeah. Um, just half a day's filming, you know. And the next thing I heard was, um, would I go in and audition for The Voice of Tim? Um, which wasn't what I was thinking of at all. Um, so I went to an audition for that, but unfortunately the casting director didn't have any notes from the producer at all. So I didn't know whether to play British, American or Canadian, which is what Phil was. So I did it three or four different ways. Never heard another word. And I thought, oh, well, mm. that's the end of that. Um, then suddenly, and I think it was October or maybe the month before 2013, I got a call out of the blue saying, what are you doing at the end of the month? Can you come mm. over to America? Um, we actually we filmed it in Canada. Uh, and I said, yeah, but I thought you decided you didn't want me. He said, no, no, no. We just thought that it was having you in just for a little walking past the window was a waste. So we've written a scene for you. Which I thought was very nice. How can you say mm. no to that? So I told my wife um, to go on a holiday on her own, not take me, the one that we booked. Um, <laughs> she took my son instead. He fortunately has the same name. Otherwise, right. we'd have to pay a panel penalty to change the name. <laughs> so they went off and, and I went off to Canada while they did that. Um, and then I spoke to Greg, the producer, and I said, How, you, why did you choose to make this? What was the interest? And he said, well, um, I grew up on the, with the Tomorrow People with Julie Pleck, who was his co-producer. Mm. And I said, but you're not old enough. You're not old enough. He said, oh, but you have to remember it went out in America 10 years later. Uh, so that that explained everything, you know. Yeah. Um, but anyway, they, they were devotees. Um, I loved doing it. Um, the Americans just do everything so, so damn well when it comes to making movies. Um, I've never seen a, bla a bad American actor in my life, I don't think, um, no matter what, how small the part. It was beautifully made, um, technically streets ahead of the original, obviously, but then they had a much bigger budget. Warner Brothers were, were the financiers at the back end of it, I believe. Um, mm. uh, and yeah, it was it was an absolute joy. Mm. And you played, was it Aldous Crick? as well in the series. Yes. I mean, yeah. clearly I couldn't play John. Um, <laughs> they didn't have CGI as good 10 years ago as they do now. So with the best will in the world, I couldn't even play 20, never mind 16. So, yeah, they did create that character, which is a cross between Aldous uh, Huxley and uh, Crick, who was the co-discoverer of the double helix DNA hmm. thing. Um, so that that's where that character name came from. Um, and again, I didn't know whether they wanted me to play an American or whatever, but English was quite fashionable by then. So I just played it as an English professor working in one of the American universities. So that's how we decided to play it. Yeah. Um, and uh, I no, they had no notes. They just said, um, get on with it. Do it as however you like. And in fact, it was quite interesting. The writer, when it went out, the writer said, I said, were they happy with it or what? You know, Warner Brothers. And he said, um, he said, you're the only actor they haven't got any notes for. So, <laughs> <laughs> take that how you like. <laughs> I don't know, I was beyond help, or they like what I did. <laughs> so how do you think the, the, the new John uh, was compared to your John in the series? It was very, he was very good. Uh, uh, everyone was very good. Um, yeah. And they tried to tie it up in, in a few different ways. I mean, the, the character of John in the original didn't, we never get to hear his surname. They called the character in the American version John Young, which is obviously a nod to me. Mm. Um, and uh, I, I thought he played it very well. My only criticism of him was he said to me, when I heard you were going to be in it, I wondered if you'd forgotten how to act. Oh, oh, dear, 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 dear. <laughs> um, <laughs> but again he was he was very kind um it made some very kind comments particularly on my death scene for some reason he thought that was very good <laughs> um maybe other motivations behind his comments i don't know um no i thought i thought everybody was very good i like the korean was he or japanese i'm not sure what character he was but he was very good too um I, if i dare criticize the main problem in my view was that as originally written, it was meant to mirror pubescence. You were growing, changing from being a child to a young man. Mm. And, um, you know, you start, it, the most insecure time of your life, you suddenly find you've got these special powers. It, it inspired yes. a lot of people in England. And a lot of people have told me that. 
yeah. the American version. Um, you know, he was at university that much older. He was 18 or 19, supposedly. And you lost that element of it completely. And I think that was probably its biggest mistake. Yeah. It was a different audience. It was a, a, a young adult audience rather than a teenage audience or even a young prepubescent audience. Yeah. What did you do immediately after the BBC series? BBC series of... Oh, sorry, Tomorrow People. Oh, that you mean Thames? You don't yeah, like yeah, Thames? Yeah, sorry, yeah. Um, I did... What did I do immediately? I, was, I mean, I was pretty much what they call a jobbing actor, just going from one... Mm early insignificant role to the next. I did a series called, um, what was it called? I huh, can't remember. It was based on the kidnapping of a member of the royal family. It was originally called Blood Royal, which is why I'm having difficulty remembering it. Uh -huh. um, it was then called Blood Money, that's right. And it was about a kidnapping of, uh, of, of a member of the royal family from his private school. And I played his bodyguard in that. Um, then I did uh, a couple of other things. I did a thing called Kessler, which again has been shown again on Talking Pictures yeah. quite recently. Um, and that was a follow-up to Secret Army. It's about um, what happened to Kessler uh, after the war. Everybody thought he'd either been killed or disappeared. And mm. he suddenly reappears as a German industrialist and he's leading the neo-Nazi party, which is based in Argentina. Well, of course, in the early 80s, that's where they all were. Yeah. Uh, all the old Nazis have gone to South America. Uh, so that was a very good series. Um, and I, I played um, Nasty Nazi, as or any other kind, um, <laughs> which and I always enjoy playing Dylan. So that was that was great fun. Um, then what I did, I did a film in Iraq called The Great Question, um, which was a, a film made by the Iraqi government. They were at war with Iran at the time. And they wanted to find some glorious episode in Iraqi history. Apparently they had a skirmish with the British in 1920, so that was their equivalent of the Battle of Waterloo. Um, it had yeah. a stellar cast. Every every British actor ever heard of went out there to do it. All the British actors had to wear moustaches to demonstrate they were British, and yeah. uh, all, the, all the heroes wore beards, as all good Arabs do. So um, that's what that was about. It took a year to film. I wasn't out there for a year. I was out there for about six weeks. Um, essentially had no budget by which I mean you want, want more money and they just get out a bag of cash and hand it over to the director and you know it needed to be made and that was it mm. um and uh, it was a dodgy time when we were out there the, there were air raid sirens every night and uh we had to fly with all the lights switched off on the plane by which I mean the red lights on the wingtips as well which is all yeah. a bit nerve-wracking and when we finished the filming it was considered too dangerous to fly out so we had to go across land to a man in jordan which was 14 hours in a coach that had no air conditioning it was <laughs> deeply unpleasant <laughs> and as we traveled along we'd see the odd it would see car wrecks <laughs> and with vultures right. on them you know that sort of thing <laughs> and i don't think i don't think there was such a thing as the iraqi aa if you broke down in the middle of the desert I and mean, then that was it yeah, um, but it's an experience you would wouldn't want to miss. It was I thoroughly enjoyed it, and it's a very good opening line at a dinner party where I was in bed, Dad. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it um, it's certainly a conversation stopper. Mm, brilliant. Okay. Uh, well, thanks for taking the time to do the interview. Nick, it's been really appreciated. I really enjoyed the chat. Yeah. I can't remember why we did this before. It was so long ago now. Oh, it was for a book uh, I was doing. So, uh, uh, well, uh, what was the book? It was called, called Stars, so it was, um, it was um, children's series and that sort of thing, science fiction series. Um, I'll send you a copy if you like. Yeah, if you, I was going to say, was it published? It was, presumably. It was, yes, it's on Amazon yes. and a few oh. bookstores. Oh, right. I uh, I have my book here. You asked oh. me what I was doing afterwards. Have you, yeah. Is that back to front or can you see it's it right from now? It says Car Number Classics. Ah, Okay. It's it's bigger than War and Peace. <laughs> it's thirteen, well, rather more interesting. I like to think it's thirteen hundred odd pages, wow. and it follows it, it follows. There's F one issued in nineteen oh four on uh -huh. its original vehicle, and there is the same number on its present Bugatti. Ah, uh, okay. Um, and there's the back is similar. It's BM one on its original vehicle, hmm. and then at the bottom it's it's on an Aston. Wow. Um, and it's the story of the first uh, ten. Uh, motorists of, in every county or county borough council of England and Wales um, and uh, uh, some Scottish and some Irish but predominantly English and Welsh um, and it covers a very wide range of um, of motoring um, what do you call them 
movers and shakers of early Edwardian days. It's a fascinating mm. story. The biographies are some very interesting people. But I cover motorbikes as well. And that, of course, mm. covers the other end of the social scale because cars tended to be the very rich mm. and motorcycles tended to be those who couldn't afford a car. So mm. it, it's a, I found it a fascinating book. Managed to shift a thousand copies. So it's done quite well. Oh, brilliant. More than mine. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> You'll catch up shortly, I'm sure. Yeah, but I would like to see a copy. Yeah, that'd be nice. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. If you email me your um uh, your address, I'll get that sorted out for you. Okay. Uh, what are you doing with this? Are you showing the whole interview live, or are you? Uh, oh no, going sorry. So this is going to be recorded, and it's recorded, obviously. But I'm going to edit it a little bit and then uh, put it onto a YouTube yeah. channel. So I'll send you a link okay. so you can. Yes, yeah, so let me know when up. that's out. That'd be good. That'd be great. Okay. Well, it's nice talking to you too, and I look forward to seeing your book. And I will email you my address very shortly. Thank you. Well, you take care. And thanks again. And you. Thanks very much. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Oh, we're hoping to get this right before tomorrow, people. <laughs>